Hello and welcome to Cannabis Live. I'm Craig Aronoff along with Barton Morris and we're from the Cannabis Legal Group and we're here on Friday to talk about state and municipal licensing. One thing I wanted to add is that, uh, well, a lot of things I want to add, but uh, <laughs> one thing I want to point out is that we want to try to do this show every Friday uh, in the morning, like 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. It's 8.37 right now on Friday. And uh, we want to be uh, regularly broadcasting at the same time so people know what to turn in. So that's uh, what our intent is. Just Fridays at 8 o'clock in the morning. And each week we're going to be talking about different topics that relate to Michigan's medical marijuana market, um, be it you know licensing requirements as we'll be talking about today. But in the future we'll be talking about things like raising capital and real estate and a lot of the other items that we hear from our clients about every day. The uh, market right now is, is about to go crazy. Our, uh, the applications are going to be available soon. More, more uh, importantly, uh, I think um, the regulations are going to be coming out soon. The Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs and their Bureau of Medical Marijuana is uh, really active about, uh, about um, creating these things. And, uh, and so that's part of what we want to talk about today, which is the requirements are going to be necessary uh, for uh, municipal and uh, state license for a medical marijuana facilities licensing act. Yeah, in fact, the board was appointed. They had their first public meeting last week. Um, a lot of discussion regarding the timetable that we'll see from the regulations. Um, we know they're working on it, and I know the specifics are coming, but there's some general things that we know we will see, and that's what we want to talk about today in terms of you know the type of requirements. So. First thing we want to do is talk about where you're going to be located. We know that the state statute says that, you know, when you apply, you need to know that the municipality has an ordinance where they've opted in and that the location of your business has been approved for zoning purposes for that facility. So the key is having a legal interest in the property. So tell us about that, Bart. All right. So having a legal interest means that you have some type of uh, authority over this property so that the city can say that you, in fact, do have the ability to be able to get it licensed. So a legal interest could, of course, mean that you own it. And, uh, and oftentimes uh, that's what is what is ideal is, the, is direct ownership. Uh, but that's not the only way. And, and there's multiple ways of direct ownership as well. Like, for instance... Um, I think something that is, is coming up a lot are land contracts. Land contract is a, is a device, a contractual arrangement where a lessee, uh, uh, meaning somebody who is the individual occupying or, or leasing the business, is going to have the opportunity to actually buy it outright at the end of the land contract. And so there'll be, it'll be kind of like a lease, but at the end of the contract, at the, that term, however long that may be, which could be as short as a couple of years or as long as even 10 years, it still gives uh, the individual, um, that, le that, lease, uh, that leasee, the opportunity to buy it and, and a contractual right to buy it so that uh, uh, they can be in a land contract. It's kind of like a lease. They're giving their, 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 their payments, regular payments to the lessor. At the end of that uh, contractual term, they can buy it just uh, with a lump sum payment, whatever is uh, whatever's contemplated in the contract. Uh, or simply just uh, maybe it just terminates those payments are done and now the, the lessee now owns it and, uh, contractually um, with the, I guess a uh, deed. Yeah, in fact, we there's there's a couple things as we as we can talk about in that in that setting. Um, first of all, if it's a land contract, you actually have an ownership interest. You become the taxpayer. So when you when you sign a land contract, although it's a payment similar to the lease as Barton was describing, where you're paying a monthly fee, but what you're paying for is actually gaining you equity in the building with each payment. And so every payment is one step closer to full ownership of the property, whatever that contract requires, and for whatever term it is, and then you, at the end of that term, you make your final payment and obtain the deed from the seller, which is the vendor or landlord. Um, but what happens is, is that right from the onset, you get the file with the city that you are the owner of the building because that land contract is recorded and makes you the owner for taxpayer purposes. And so that's separate from a lease where a landlord retains that ownership interest and is giving you the stick of possession, the bundle of rights as it's called. And as a tenant, you have the right to possess and use the property as you wish because that's the right you've obtained for the payment you're making each month. 
And in the industry, we know that the statute already says that a landlord and a tenant in, in a medical marijuana facility have to have that in the agreement, the intent of the, of the tenant to actually be using the facility for a medical marijuana purpose. And the landlord has to sign off on that. And if they do, it makes them immune from uh, forfeiture laws under Michigan law as long as the tenant stays compliant. And so that's the arrangement that will be had in the lease agreement. But again, going back to legal interest, what we're really saying is, is that ultimately you have a claim to the property to use it for the purpose you're seeking. And that claim can come in the form of a contract that either gives you an ownership or possession interest. Which also includes a lease. Uh, so you, uh, as a uh, less, lessee to somebody who wants to lease a building, can lease that building. And, and at that time, when there's a, a contract in place, which I believe has to be a written contract, yes. um, now you have an ownership interest in the building uh, sufficient in what is necessary to satisfy the requirements of the municipality in order to apply for uh, a license in medical marijuana facilities license. So just being a lessee is, uh, is, yeah. is enough. And, and, it, and it's key that it has to be for some extended period of time though. It can't be a one month or a month to month lease because they're not going to allow you to just build out the facility and end up getting a, you know, having to move out and let somebody else be operating that they weren't anticipating. So what we've seen already in every municipality, and I'll kind of roll into the second part of this, which is, you know, what are the municipalities doing? And that kind of rolls very favorably into the discussion that they're all a little bit different. We know that there's some that are going to be relatively hands-off, meaning they're going to just allow their operators to come in and, you know, be a little bit looser on how close or far they are from different things within their township, be it churches or schools. And then others that might say, we want to know every detail. We want to know the business plan. We want to know the standard operating procedures. And so within each municipality, there might be a requirement as it relates to the property itself that says if you're a tenant, you have to have minimally a one-year lease with a one-year option. So they can rely on you as a tenant for a two-year period. But as we look at that, that's just one facet. And of course, the municipality might have a lot of other differing uh, you know, things within their licensing requirements. So uh, speaking about municipality licensing requirements, uh, we know that it's going to differ between city to city, as Craig said. Uh, I want to comment on the fact that I know that in Denver, Colorado, for instance, their licensing requirements sometimes exceed that of what is necessary of the state of Colorado. That could happen here, yeah. uh, or it may not. We don't know exactly, but we do know from our experience in dealing with a lot of these municipalities what like the city of Detroit, for instance, what they do uh, like to see, and one of those things is a security plan. Yeah, certainly. What they want to know, and, and very uh, important across every community really, is how safe are these structures going to be? How are they worried about crime in the community? They're worried about, you know, how do they enforce it? And what's going to happen, of course, is, is that our operators are going to come in with a detailed security plan. We'll be able to show from our building plans where all the cameras will be. We'll be able to show where maybe the, um, you know, the, uh, the, mag the, the chip that will be to allow the employees in. Access, so, yeah, yeah, the access cards and whatnot for all the employees. Um, and so in the security planning, it, it's not only enough for us to say that the state is going to allow this and have this required enforcement, but we're telling the municipalities how they as a local municipality will be able to help and see at any given time how their operators are you know, running their businesses and where their employees are parking and, you know, who's coming in and out of those buildings is going to be available to a lot of these enforcement agencies. Municipalities worry about things that are typically, um, uh, that municipalities typically uh, wonder about or, or worry about, things like security, but also like waste management. Mm -hmm. that, uh, municipality cities are always interested in the manner in which that a property is being used that may affect um, other either city services or other properties. And so waste management is another uh, key area that municipalities are going to be interested in. They want to see exactly what you're going to be doing with waste because that is an issue that comes up with uh, medical marijuana facilities, both with um, well, probably more specifically with cultivation facilities, sure, uh, but but also with dispensaries as well and processors as well. So uh, that's that's going to be a typical uh, standard um, document and, and necessity for a licensee to have in order to buy the a city. And, and really, what we're talking about there is, let's say you have your uh, dumpster outside. Is it locked? 
is it locked from the exterior to the extent where if somebody was, you know, coming in and diving into your garbage, are they walking away with bags of print? Are they walking away with things that actually could be produced and used in the medical marijuana industry? So the waste management is something that's very key for these operators to show that it's not only what their plan is for it, but that it's secure from any, you know, concerns from, from the outside. Um, and, you know, along with that, of course, is going to be things like uh, the water plan and what they're going to do. And I think one of the most important things, especially for cultivators and growers, is going to be the nuisance of the smell and that the operators have taken that into consideration in advance of building their building, but they're putting in the proper air filtration that they're actually showing and demonstrating to the municipality that despite there maybe being a 1500 plant grow, that it's not going to be something that smells up the entire neighborhood, but that they're actually using these high tech carbon filters and these other filters that are available in the marketplace to actually protect against that nuisance possibility. Good point. Um, another thing that uh, many people don't think about, but uh, we recommend to our clients every single time is a plan to demonstrate how the facility is going to improve the surrounding community. So like a community improvement plan. There should be a plan for that uh, because every municipality to whatever, some degree or another has a concern about a facility being located within their city that is going to um, de de deteriorate uh, uh, a location when in fact we can demonstrate to that city that it's going to improve the surrounding community. Just like when the, I remember when the MGM Casino came into Detroit. They, they have done a significant amount of effort in order to improve the surrounding uh, area in order to increase the property value because uh, people thought a casino might decrease property values because they didn't want that type of, uh, you know, that type of entity in, in the area. When in fact, uh, MGM, and I'm sure the other ones as well, had plans necessary to show them that they were going to increase uh, adjacent property values and be a welcome uh, partner in the community. Yeah, and, and that's really talking about corporate citizenry, and, and it's something that as I speak to townships and as we go around the state, that term is often mentioned. What is a good corporate citizen? It's somebody, of course, that pays their taxes. Um, we know that that's something, and we've spoken about that in prior Tana Business Live episodes, the need and requirement for paying your taxes, whether it's the 280E or your property taxes, which affect the local municipality directly in the county in which you're going to be operating. But that corporate citizenry goes beyond that. What else are you doing to better and improve and, and engage in the community that you're operating? And what we found is a lot of the clients that we're representing when they go and when we're talking to townships are very sincere and intend to be a part of the community. They're not just looking to operate in the dark and in the back corners and be left alone. They're actually looking to participate in the community and actually be involved in the, those things like making decisions about how we can improve roads and how we can create parks and how we can actually involve ourselves in a way that's a positive reflection for the community and for your business as a whole. And so those are things that are going to be very important for our, our clients to consider as they move forward. I know there are a couple of questions. And so uh, I wanted to say stick around so that we can, we can uh, get to those questions. If anybody else has any questions, please do please. Uh, let us know so that we can address those as well. Um, but let's get to our, uh, Oh, so, uh, let's move on to state licensing, requirements sure. for state licensing. Um, many of these municipal considerations that we're referring to are going to be necessary for state licensing as well. Um, but, and even though we don't know uh, exactly what the regulations are going, to, uh, are going to specify with respect to those requirements, our experience and our understanding of the licensing requirements in other states makes it very clear and obvious to, to us as to what our client or what anybody should uh, be doing an effort to prepare themselves for a successful state application. And I think we, one of the things we can start with our, our discussion is about uh, business planning and financial um, considerations. Yeah, certainly. And, and, and although the, our rules are, are not quite known, we do know that roughly, you know, give or take 78% of all the various state applications around the country have very similar things within them and the other 15 to 20 or 30% are those that vary and so some states are a little bit more strict on what they want for capitalization than others but most importantly in this business planning of course is laying out the outline of what it is you intend to do as a, as a company 
from what your mission statement is through who all the parties are that are going to be uh, you know taking part in it as far as ownership interests whether you know if you're a cultivator who your master grower is what their experiences are what your you know growing style might be or your manufacturing style or whatever dispensary setup you intend to have so depending on the license that you're seeking you're going to tailor that business plan to really focus on how you're only going to be set up but how you're going to operate and how your pro and project is going to be properly funded. We know that that's going to be a very significant factor because the state wants to know that from the time you start your project to the time you see your first penny in revenue, that you're able to carry your business, pay your employees, keep your lights on, and make sure that all your bills are paid so that there isn't a problem with your business before the time frame to make money. And we all know it's going to take a little bit of time from the beginning until we see that revenue come in. That's correct. Uh, you know, I think that the state is going to also require multiple years of business planning as well. So even after a business has uh, begins to begin to uh, to earn revenue, uh, it's a matter of what's the long term, or at least like uh, short term and long term goals and and financial considerations that need to be uh, need to be planned for. Um, so expense expenditures, uh, all all anticipated expenditures. Uh, anticipated revenue, even anticipated shortfalls and, and, and problems that, that we all know as business owners can occur and will occur. Sure. These things have to be planned for as well. And so the more realistic these this planning is, uh, uh, the better it's going to be. Because it's got to be realistic. I mean, there's a lot of people that can throw together a business plan. But if it's not realistic and based upon um, good facts and, uh, and good um, uh, planning, uh, then it's not going to be taken seriously. So a good business plan is important, which, as, a, as I said earlier, is going to lead to what type of financial scenario, what type of financial circumstances are going to be necessary to demonstrate. Like, for instance, how much capital is going to be necessary? How much liquidity is going to be necessary? We get that question a lot. Well, how much money do I need to have in the bank in order to demonstrate that I have enough for the, for the, to require, uh, to, for the city, or excuse me, for the state, to say that that's enough. Well, I think that that's going to be different for every business. Every licensee is going to be different depending upon your business plan, depending upon the amount of expenses that you're planning on having on a monthly uh, basis. You know, and some other considerations that are going to be very important for that business planning, and this leads into a secondary item of the standard operating procedures, the SOP, but within the business plan, you want to be able to articulate all the areas you're going to have standard operating procedures. So it's one thing to say these are the specifics of what the trimmers are going to need to do and break it down to the very minutia of each standard operating procedure within the business. But in the general plan, the one that you're telling the state about, you've got to show these considerations that you've had a well thought out intent with each of these various aspects of your business so that things like HR are considered, employees. Guess what? You're all going to be business owners. Those operators, whether it's a 500 plant grow, a dispensary, that each might have somewhere between a dozen and 15 full-time employees, or maybe you're a 1,500 plant you know, a grower, and you may have as high as 35, 40 employees, depending upon your business plan. As an employer, you have to have proper HR. You have to have proper payroll considerations. And those are things that are going to be a part of that business plan that you've taken into consideration what your labor costs are going to be, and what your labor force will look like, and what they're, you know, what they're going to be, um, you know, doing, and and splitting that up so that you're telling the state what you know what you're going to be bringing to the community that you're licensed in, and and that's going to be another important part of the overall picture. But the details of that have to be laid out in advance, and we have to take the time between now and the time we apply to build those out for our clients. So uh, another thing that we can discuss uh, quickly uh, is that it's going to be necessary to demonstrate that the, all the persons that are going to have any type of financial interest in the licensee or in the business is going to have to demonstrate that they have a history of good business acumen. In other words, what prior businesses have you operated and have they been operated in a professional and compliant and regulatory um, compliant manner? Uh, that, that leads to issues like taxation, as the business owner paid their taxes properly. Um, and it also leads to issues that um, uh, I think that a lot of people don't realize is that they, they have moral integrity. 
if you've been operating a business uh, within uh, the past five years or even longer that hasn't demonstrated moral integrity, that hasn't demonstrated moral integrity, that is going to have a significant negative effect, uh, impact upon your ability to get a license. So um, what do you think about that? Oh, I, I think that's going to be very true. And, and that kind of leads into you know, another aspect of it is where is your money coming from? You know, we already know that the state is going to be vetting every person who has a 1% interest or more in the, in the uh, project. And so a lot of people will be funding it with capital and that's their position in the operating agreement. They're just the investors and they're going to be vetted just the same as the managing operators. And what's very important is, is that we know and are able to demonstrate that all the money is clean money coming into the venture. And that goes back to moral integrity. What were these businesses? Where did you make your money before? How have you spent that in terms of you know, investment in other businesses? If you're invested in the industry elsewhere, that's going to be something the state wants to know about because they want to ensure that you've actually operated correctly in those other areas. And so to that end, you know, moral integrity is going to go only, you know, not only from the business side, but also into the personal acumen and things that you've done personally. And so we already know criminal history is going to be an obstacle, but maybe some bad business practices of the individuals will also be an obstacle. Well, yeah, and that, that leads me to think immediately about the, all the dispensaries that are in operation right now and cultivation uh, facilities that are in operation right now. Uh, Every operator of a dispensary that's going on right now needs to understand that if you were to disclose that you are operating a dispensary, which is in violation of state law right now, if they're engaged in sales of, of medical marijuana uh, to a patient that it is not from their directed caregiver, that's a violation of state law. And that is also um, a, a really good example of a failure to have moral integrity. So, and I, I'd say most, if not all, of the dispensaries that are in operation right now are doing just that. So um, I believe, I know to be true, that that is going to be something that is going to be looked upon um, very um, not favorably by the Medical Marijuana Board. And I think, I think that they even said yeah. something or something, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the state trooper who's on the board spoke at the, at the open meeting and mentioned that you know, those that have been operating illegally under the MMMA, the old law, um, are likely to have a difficult time getting a license under the new law. And that's a paraphrase of it, um, but to be clear, we don't know what the rules will be. And so that's where if you are operating and you are within you know, a permit and are operating with the city's permission wherever you're at, a municipality, um, what we need to do is maybe take a step back and look at make sure that the business is, you know, is operating as a good corporate citizen as we described before. And, you know, we don't know yet what obstacle will be for those operators to get a license in the end, but we got to start working on at least cleaning up and making sure taxes are paid, making sure everything is itemized as though they were actually operating with a proper license in the future. And if we don't at least have a barrier to show that we've done everything you'd expect of us next year, there's no way they're going to give you a license for it next year. And so we know that is going to be a bare minimum, but um, we're going to see more come out in our hope is that there's going to be ways to work through that. But very importantly, of course, is, is that, you know, we have to stay in compliance with whatever law we're operating under. And the MMMA has very strict guidelines for yeah. caregivers and patients. So we can conclude, I'd like to conclude simply by saying that I think it's really important to, uh, to, just because the application is available in December doesn't mean that you don't start working on it now. I think it's very important to start working on that application, all of the aspects that we've just talked about and additional ones, all of the ones that we anticipate that are going to, to going to be an issue with respect to the application. Certainly this, the municipal application, uh, we, we're doing good work and many others are doing good work uh, on, um, on getting municipal licenses, but the state license is not something to be uh, overlooked, it's not something to be pushed off. We need to start I would say uh, licensees, people who are seeking a license, need to start considering and working on those aspects uh, now. Yeah, they're all going to take time, and we need that time in order to get you best situated. Forgive my squinting, but I'm trying to read these uh, questions. Yeah, one is, uh, is it a different license or type of license to own a compassion shop instead of a dispensary? Um, in the future, we're going to have provisioning centers as defined by the MMFLA, that's the New Michigan Medical Marijuana Facility Licensing Act. 
that is the law that will allow you to dispense marijuana uh, in Michigan to qualified patients. Um, the compassion shop that's described is maybe something more akin to what is currently operating with some permission in the towns. Um, and again, I think those fall into a uh, question of whether or not they're in compliance with the MMM or the old law. And so what we need to do is focus only on provisioning centers in the future because that's what the laws provide. All right. All right. So Roy has asked a question about whether it will be, uh, be permissible to have permits to carry concealed weapon and concealed weapons on, um, on licensed facilities. Uh, and let me, let me start by saying this. When I, I was in Colorado recently, and many of the facilities that I had saw, that I had went to, um, did have armed uh, personnel there. Uh, and, and many did not. I believe that this, especially given the state of our law right now with respect to, to permits for carry concealed weapon and the likelihood that they're gonna even get rid of that altogether, I believe it's, it's, it indicates that there will be um, concealed weapons permitted on licensed properties. That's my personal belief. Uh, uh, just based upon what I see and based upon what I what I know. Uh, of course, it's going to be regulated. Not everybody's going to be able to carry a, 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 a weapon. Um, I think that uh, the state is going to want to know if anybody is carrying a weapon. They're, they're going to regulate exactly how it should be carried. Maybe only uh, owners may be able to, to carry a concealed weapon as opposed to employees. Or if it's a security guard, the security guard is going to have to display that weapon so it's not going to be concealed. It's going to have to be uh, open and obvious. Um, there are going to be regulations certainly about it, but uh, I do believe that the state is going to allow weapons uh, to be permitted uh, to be carried uh, on licensed properties. And that gets into the other question that Dustin asked about possessing an MMA, uh, MJ card. Um, do you forfeit your Second Amendment rights? Um, and, and in that vein, you know, we, there's, there's two sides of it. If you have marijuana on you, do you have to have your gun on you at the same time? And that just is something that we should provide a lot of caution with. We know that you can have both cards, um, although, you know, there, there are some questions about whether or not the state would like you to have both cards. But the reality is, is that it, it is possible to have them both. The question is, is it good practice and good um, intent to drive around with both on you? No. And, and I would say no. <laughs> yeah, that, the, the, one of the biggest considerations is being under the influence of marijuana while being in possession of a firearm. Right. So uh, if you're not under, under the influence, if a patient is not under the influence, being uh, recently smoked or uh, consumed cannabis, um, then it's a lot safer. But if there's, if there's been any recent use at all, and I, I define recent as 12 hours, um, because a blood test, I mean, can literally, um, it could, uh, a THC, active THC can remain in our bodies for in excess of 12 hours. But I think 12 hours is probably a, a good um, period of time. That type of use, uh, there should not be combined with being in possession uh, of a weapon. So, but I think that a lot, and I get this question a lot, simply just having a card for, um, for medical marijuana, being a patient or a caregiver does not preclude somebody from also being in possession of a firearm or for getting their, um, their concealed pistol um, license. Uh, there's one other issue that I, I need to discuss when it comes to that, though, is federal law. Uh, federal law prohibits anybody that's addicted to any controlled one substance to be in possession of a, of a firearm. So then it becomes the question as to what does addicted to a, a controlled uh, schedule one controlled substance and it, de it defines addiction as well. It is the subject of an article that I wrote on our website um, but specifically it, it states that uh, somebody is dependent upon um, a physically dependent upon a, a, a controlled uh, schedule one substance to the degree to which that it's going to endanger um, the, the public safety and, and health and uh, where it becomes a dangerous scenario. So uh, that is up to um, that is up to um, um, interpretation, and uh, but that's certainly something that needs to be uh, considered because federal uh, law is uh, is very is very dangerous uh, subject to deal with when uh, talking about criminal offenses. Yeah, absolutely, and so I guess the the summary to that answer really is: be smart about it. If you've smoked recently, or if there's a question about whether or not you could be deemed to have been intoxicated. Just 
try not to, uh, you know, just don't carry your pistol with you while you have your medical marijuana on you. That's probably the smartest advice that we can give in that regard. All right, Roy asked about uh, accurate testing. That's a, that's a whole other subject that, uh, that I actually love talking about. In fact, perhaps that will be the subject uh, of our next show next week. Um, but we, we've run out of time for today. So uh, we'll get to that next time uh, because that's uh, uh, testing is actually really, really near dear to your heart too. <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll stop now. Uh, but uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, share this if you think somebody else is going to, uh, to appreciate it. And uh, we will uh, be back here next Friday. And, 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 yeah, and certainly if you have other questions, please feel free to post them on the, on the yeah. site. We will respond um, and we'll look forward to talking to you then. I, for uh, Craig Arnoff and Barton Morris. Thank you for watching Canada Business Live.